Sahanavavatu Sahanao Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahai Tejasvi Navadhi Tamastu Mavidvishavahai Aum Shantihi 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 Aum Prate bravimi tadume nibodha Svargya magnin nachiketa prajanan Ananta loka pratishtam Vidhi svametang nihitam guhayam O nachiketa, being well aware of the fire that is conducive to heaven, I shall tell you of it. That very thing you understand with attention from my words. That fire which is the means for the attainment of heaven and which is the support of the world, know it to be established in the intellect of the enlightened ones. And now Shankaracharya's Tika. Nachiketas, O Nachiketa, Te to you. Pra bravimi, I shall say what was prayed for by you. Me, from me, from my words. Nibodha, understand with attention. Tat u, that very thing, that is, svargyam agnim, the fire that is conducive to heaven, that is the means for the attainment of heaven. I shall tell you, prajanan, being well aware of it, this is the idea. The expressions, I shall tell you and understand with attention, are meant for fixing the attention of the disciple on the subject. Now he praises the fire. That, that fire, which is anantalokaptim, the attainment of infinite world, that is, the means for the attainment of the result, viz. heaven. Ato, and also, Pratishtam, the support of the universe in the form of Virat, the cosmic person. Etam, this, this fire which is being spoken of by me. Vidhi, you know, as Nihitam Guhayam, located in the hidden place, that is, placed in the intellect of men of knowledge. Namaste. Well, this is a difficult verse, and it's really the first verse that gets into non-duality as a topic in the Upanishad. Although non-duality, of course, is the conclusion of this and all the new Upanishads. Still, so far we've been dealing with a story that happens in dualistic space, dualistic consciousness which is, you know, Nachiketa, the sacrifice, then going to meet death, and death giving him a boon, and now he's going to give the second boon, which is the fire that leads to heaven. Not just ordinary heaven, the temporary heaven of the lower demigods, but the heaven of the immortals, those who live for the entire duration of the universe. So, there is a double meaning in this verse. There's a hidden meaning. And it's uh, very clearly stated uh, that it's guhyam, hidden, in the intellect of the enlightened beings. So even though that's not directly stated, that's supplied by Shankaracharya in his tika, still, that's really the meaning here. What is described as a sacrificial fire is actually a process of meditation. And the clue, of course, is that this fire is hidden in the intellect of the enlightened beings. But what kind of fire can be hidden in the intellect? <laughs> 
It's also the Virat. The Virat is the all-pervading Brahman. That is the support of the entire universe. So rather than try to explain this <laughs> with my limited intelligence, I'm going to go to Shankaracharya in another book in his commentary, his very extensive commentary on Bhagavad Gita. And in the Bhagavad Gita, in the chapter on Jnana Yoga, the yoga of realization, self-realization, there's the following verse. Brahmarpanam Brahma Havir Brahmagnau Brahmana Hutang Brahmaivatena Gantavyang Brahma Karma Samadhina the translation, Brahman is the offering, Brahman the oblation. By Brahman is the oblation poured into the fire of Brahman. Brahman verily shall be reached by him who always sees Brahman in action. So yeah, this is deep. This is very, very deep. In other words, the meaning is given or the simile or the uh, metaphor of the fire is given to support those who see the Vedic path as a path of sacrifice. In fact, in the Brahmanas and the Vedas themselves, explicit and detailed directions for performing the fire sacrifice are given. So here in the Upanishad, the description of the deep meaning. The real meaning is given or unfolded gradually from the image of the sacrifice. Now in the sacrifice, you have a sacrificer, a priest, and you have a supporting group of brahmanas chanting the Vedic hymns while the sacrificer chants secret mantras and pours the oblations of various precious substances like ghee and so on into the fire. So he's using this image to show that actually the real sacrifice is offering the contents of the senses, the objects of the senses into the fire of the controlled mind. And that's also described in Bhagavad Gita in very explicit language. But what is the connection with Virat? Well, the best way I can explain it is to let Shankaracharya explain the purport or the meaning of this verse. He says, The man who has realized Brahman sees that the instrument by which the oblation is poured in the fire is nothing but Brahman, that it has no existence apart from that of the self, just as silver has no existence apart from that of the mother of pearl mistaken for silver. What in the illustration appears as silver is nothing but the mother of pearl. What people look upon as the instrument of offering is, to one who has realized Brahman, nothing but Brahman. Brahman is the oblation, that is, what is regarded as oblation is to him nothing but Brahman. And it is by Brahman that the offering is made, that is, the agent is none other than Brahman. The act of offering is nothing but Brahman, and the result, the goal to be reached by him who always sees Brahman in action, is nothing but Brahman. And this goes on. <laughs> it's very long. I don't want to read the whole thing because I don't want to bore you. But I do want you to get the idea that, as the Mahavakya says, Sarva Kalvidam Brahma. Everything is Brahman. And this is the vision of one who has realized Virat. Virat is the all pervading consciousness existence and bliss, satchit ananda, Brahman that underlies all manifestations of this material world. 
Actually, what we call material is nothing but illusion. It's like the rope and the snake. Brahman, the rope, is the reality. The snake, which is seen by a person who is like half asleep, <laughs> is an illusion. It's a projection. It's an avyaya, a superimposition on the reality. So, one who actually sees, sees that even these religious ceremonies, all the elements are nothing but Brahman. The oblation, the instrument by which the oblation is offered into the fire, the fire itself, the performer, and the action are all only Brahman. Well, what else could they be, right? If the material manifestation is illusion, if it's the snake that we hallucinate and superimpose on the reality, which is nothing but Brahman, nothing but pure consciousness, then there really is nothing but Brahman in reality. This is the purport here. This is the Nachiketa fire. So this fire, this Brahman, this all-pervading consciousness exists in the intellect of the enlightened people. And this will go on, this Upanishad will go on to explain this in detail in the upcoming chapters and sections that everything is Brahman. But the instruments that we're using to perceive the world, the senses, the body, and the materially conditioned mind and consciousness are themselves illusory. So how can they give a real picture of reality? This morning I was going through some of the comments <laughs> on the videos in this channel, and man, I don't know where people get these ideas, but they don't really understand what's being said in the Supanishad. They don't really get the meaning of Brahman. Brahman is unconditioned. It's not existent, nor is it non-existent. It's not being, nor is it non-being. It's not real, nor is it unreal. We have to understand, Brahman is beyond all these dichotomies. It's beyond all distinctions. It's beyond all qualities. It has no agenda, no even consciousness. See, no qualities, no actions, no limitations of any kind. And therefore, it is not an agent. It has no purposes. It doesn't do anything. <laughs> All these are attributes of the manifested world, which are simply reflections of Brahman. We think that, for example, the body is conscious or the sen senses are aware or active. But these are nothing but reflections of various qualities, derivative qualities derived from Brahman. We've been over this again and again on this channel. Somehow or other, people just don't seem to get it. They think that Brahman has purposes and actions and instruments and all kinds of things. Now, when Brahman manifests as Shiva, Sadashiva, to monitor and manage and control the material world, yes, then it has attributes and actions and so on. But we're not talking about Sadashiva or Rudra or any of the forms of the Supreme in the material universe. We're talking here about Brahman, which is the non-dual substance of everything. And Brahman is pure awareness, awareness of awareness. Just like Turiya consciousness. In Turiya, the object of consciousness 
is the other states of consciousness. Sushupti, Svapna, and Jagrat. So when consciousness is conscious of consciousness, it's a tautology. This means that it is aware of itself alone. And there really is nothing else but the self. So, you know, this is really hard to explain in words. And uh, I'm going to link to the commentary of Shankaracharya in the video description below. So you can read the whole thing for yourself. It's very enlightening. And it goes deeper than the Upanishad because he devotes more space to explication of these uh, subtle philosophical points. So I'm going to leave you with that direction uh, because it's uh, something that you need to research. You need to take some initiative and look into on your own time because there isn't time in these short videos to go completely into the subject, completely into the topic. So we'll pick up again next time with further instructions by death and the next boon, the extra boon that he gives Nachiketa. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.